Thanks for joining us this Thursday, y'all. It is June 1st, 2023. This is Wisecrack Live. Uh, Burns will be with us in just a moment. What's up, everyone? It's uh, Wisecrack Live. It's June first. Happy June, everyone! It's exciting. Uh, you know, shout it out in the chat if June is your favorite month, and maybe tell us why June is your favorite month if that's the case. Um, yeah, is it yours? Yeah, June is my favorite month because uh, my birthday is in June. Ah, when's your birthday? If you're a June third. Oh my God, guys! Henry, it's your birthday stream. Um, well, guys, things just really changed. Whoa! Wait, wait. What? <laughs> Watch Crack Live. It's Henry's birthday stream, so make sure you give Henry a lot of love. It's also Pride Month, so both Pride and Henry's birthday, the co most important parts of June. So there you go. Um, hey, everyone! Thanks for being here. And thanks for liking the stream. We'll make sure that we are on and off. Wishing Henry happy birthday. We'll. Oh my God! It is Juneteenth. Yeah, it's a good month. It's a good month. Yeah, June's Juneteenth. a great month. We got month. Pride. We got Henry's birthday. We. I don't know. Is there any? Is there anything else in June besides the, those three things? I don't really think so. I think those are the main three things. I hope I didn't forget something that's really important. Now I'm being offensive. Um, but very excited to be back with you guys full time. You know, last week we did a little Wednesday studio tour hangout. If you didn't see that and you've ever wanted to see how we. How we make the magic here at Wisecrack. You can go check that out. Um, as you can check out all of our streams, uh, in case you didn't know that. If you're ever bored, or if you get sick, not like really bad sick, but you know, sick where you're in bed for a few days and you're just really out of it, pull up YouTube on your TV and you can just watch old Wisecrack lives and and speak, you know, with us as if you're there. Um, someone said Flag Day. Which one's Flag Day? What does that do? What what do we? Why are we? What, what flag do we celebrate? I don't know. Um, dog named cat said, Michael, tell us about the pleasure dome. Okay, guys, I did a little pleasure dome talk on the stream last week, but that was a special thing. I think it was Lexa who asked to talk about that real quick, guys. Um, we did a video on child labor in the video on child labor. Somehow pleasure dome or the phrase pleasure dome came up or wait, maybe it was in the philosophy video. I'm not totally sure, but. But um, Dead Card Gifted Memberships, thank you so much for doing that. I mentioned that I went to elementary school next to a place called the Pleasure Dome. Here's the facts of the matter, guys. I went to a place called Rainbow Elementary School in Winter Springs, Florida. Um, Josh was watching from work and we love it. I would ride my bike to school sometimes. And there was this one kind of weird house I'd always ride by. And there'd be like different people coming in and out. But whatever. I'm just a kid. I'm not suspicious. 
And then one day I was riding my bike home and there was like news trucks everywhere and there was police and all this sort of stuff because it turns out this house in suburban Orlando, Florida um, was like a sex club for older people. And I'll just say it, none of them were hot. It was the least amount of hot people I've ever seen in one place. And I'm not trying to judge people on appearance, but when you, you when you like imagine a sex club, you, you want it to be hot people. And these were not hot people. They looked like people who, I don't know, worked in like lower administrative positions at like a company that makes microwaves or something. It was rough, but um, and it turned out like every room in the suburban house was turned into a different like sex themed room. And I think money was involved as well. It was a whole thing, but you know, in suburban Florida, but we're talking about Florida today. So I'm actually glad that someone brought that up, that someone brought up the pleasure dome, because if we want to make America into Florida, we want all of America to be one big pleasure dome friends. That's what we want. Um, but yeah, and I learned about a lot of stuff because I was like in fifth grade and you start learning some stuff in fifth grade, but you know, knowing about the pleasure dome really, really makes it happen guys. So there you go. Yeah. Scarlett Voss in the chat said hot people just go have sex. No need for secret clubs. Yes. I have some really hot takes that relate to Scarlett Voss's comment that I'm not going to say out loud. Cause I think some of them are problematic. Um, and I want space for problematic takes, but maybe not on this. Uh, Kevin Simmons. Hello. Hi. Good to see you. Nice to see all the green usernames here. Someone asked this before. Green usernames are members. Members of the channel. All right. Someone said, I just want to cheat on my significant other on the DL. Damn, dude, that's a that's a bold. I mean, I guess you're anonymous and we respect honesty here. Um Barbalia Telex says, well, we talk new Harris video. We might if we get there. So there you go. Um, okay, so here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna get into. Um, we're gonna talk about some Florida stuff today because in the week that I was mostly off, ugh, some fun stuff happened. Um, Ron DeSantis, aka I hate to quote Donald Trump, but but Meatball Ron um did his like presidential an announcement he announced that he's going to run for the president and elon musk helped him and it was a disaster during the same week um rick scott senator from florida former governor of florida put out a travel advisory that was like socialist and communist and leftist don't come to florida which i thought was so funny and kind of nuts so you know we'll probably have to talk about that a little bit um Vox says I, he's tried to sit down and do some academic work on why sex clubs don't have traditionally attractive people, but it's really hard to do without being offensive. I, I get it. Like, listen, I wanted to say some things, and I wouldn't have meant the things offensively, but they could have came off offensively. Lex is asking, who wants to be the lord of the chat? Um, <laughs> Zach said, as an attractive person, yes, we just go and have sex all the time, everywhere especially in your shower. Wow. Um, let's see. Someone's, Josh was bringing up the Claremont Institute. I want to look into that, uh, Josh. I don't, I don't really know about that, so I'm not going to uh, speak on it in particular. Um, reverse fulfillment loves Marxism. Put them on the list. Get them out of here. Reverse, mar reverse fulfillment, we have, we're tracking your IP, and our anti-revolutionary forces are coming to get you. Guys, it's time I admit this. Wisecrack Live, we're funded by the CIA. What we're basically doing is tracking data on anyone who's in here who expresses any sympathies with anything that's vaguely left wing. Henry is actually an agent with the CIA. Confirmed. Um, you, yeah. So, you know, I, I wanted to be honest with you all, but many of you, many of you will be on trial very soon. Like very soon. Like honestly, during this stream you will hear knocks at the door and I would say, answer with your hands up. Be very, very careful. I'm um, in Joshua. Yes, we'll check that out. Um, unlikely events said that sometimes they like to go into their garden, cover themselves up in dirt and pretend they're a carrot. Checkmate on the list. You're done. Um, yeah, it is. It's all a psyop. Um, false flag operation <laughs> confirmed. Um, but so we'll talk about that. Let's get started. Um, let's see. 
You live in Colorado. Oh, definitely. Yeah, you guys are all fucked. You guys are fucked. And if you ever liked this stream, they're on you. You're done. Like, you are done. Liking the stream has been a trick this whole time. Bjorn Swenson said, can't spell Michael without CIA. I never realized that till right now that CIA is in my name. I'm going to have to change it. Um, okay, so... Thanks for hanging out. We're going to get into a lot of stuff today. Excited to be back again. This is Wisecrack Live. If you're just funneling in the door, if you're like one of those students that gets to class late, it's totally fine. Um, what's been going on? Well, we put out some videos since we were last together. We put out a video on if Americans can do philosophy. Some of you watched this one. Many of you didn't. That's fine. Um, but we basically looked at pragmatism. Um, and our writer and researcher, Michael Lodato, worked on that with us, which was awesome. And I'll tell you a fun story. Hopefully everyone follows Michael on, on Twitter. But He's a, a researcher and writer who lives in New York that's been working with Wisecrack for a while. And he was in L.A. last week. And myself and my colleague, Amanda, who's the deputy editor of Wisecrack, got to have some beers with him. It was very fun to meet a person I've only known online in real life. So there you go. It's very fun. Very good guy. Um, everyone should follow him. So that video came out. And then we put out a video on child labor. This is a video that many of you know I, I had a hard time with. It was just kind of a, a bummer. Um, Chris loves capitalism and Jesus and was a white man born in Maryland. Chris, you're okay. Chris, thank you so much. You're okay. Vox says, this is back to the Pleasure Dome argument. I don't think it's just attractive people have sex. They actually don't. It's more that attractive people are less likely to be into kink that requires safe spaces. I think that's true. Ring Around the Rosie says, what do you get at Chipotle? I don't know if this was to me or just the chat in general. I will answer. My standard Chipotle order is often a bowl, sometimes a burrito, but I go the veggie option. Um, normally black beans, brown rice, veggies, guac, corn salsa, hot salsa, lettuce, out. If I get the bowl and I'm feeling real cheeky, sometimes I'll get the chips as well, but they got so much salt on them. Um, C. Jefferson, glad that you're here. And I think what Vox is saying is right too. I'm just going to say it. Guys, yeah, this is we, not what we're supposed to be. Go ahead. We need a sex talk stream, apparently. Yeah, let's talk, guys. This is well, Florida is shaped like a penis, so might as well talk about True. sex today. Um, Josh was lived in Florida 40 years. Yeah, Josh, it's interesting when Josh says it's changed over the past 20 years mostly. Literally, Josh, um, I have not lived in Florida for 20 years. I lived in Florida until literally, yeah, like almost to the day 20 years ago. It was the uh, summer of 2003 that I got out of Florida. Um, and I lived there for 12, 10, 12 years before that. But speaking of sex, um, <laughs> I just think that my, this is not science. I'm not a sex sociologist. I do think the hotter people are, the more they tend to be just like pretty, pretty basic in sexual proclivity. That's what I think. I think pretty hot people just meet up and they have pretty like normal sex. And I think people who are less hot sometimes are into more experimental, extreme, and kink-based things. And I'm just going to say this off everyone. This is mean, too, because some of these people, I'm, and listen, I'm not like a certified hottie, so I say this is, is a member uh, of the mediocre middle of things. But, you know, I have some friends who have been into like really kinky stuff, and like they're not hot. They're nice. They're cool. They're very smart. But it's never like my hottest friends. And I, I haven't had a lot of hot friends in life. Um, the only exception I'll think of is one of the hottest people I currently am friends with. This is so weird to say, but one of the hottest people I'm currently friends with did try polyamory with their wife and they said it was too difficult. And I think it was too difficult because they're both hot. And I think that complicated their polyamory because my friend and his wife are both hot. I'm just going to say it. And guys, every stream I got to say something problematic. So there is my problematic take on the sexual proclivities of people based on attractiveness. But also I'll say this too, guys. I'm going to say this especially for anyone who's like younger, who's maybe worried about things like hotness. Like everyone's hot to someone and hotness is really subjective. So it's just important to know that. Um, there's people in life who you might think are hot that other people might not think are hot. You might not think you're hot, but someone thinks you're hot. So, you know, basically I would say 98% of people on the planet are hot to someone. And I think all of you are at least in that 98%. So there you go. And hot people can like kinks too. I'm just, I'm being problematic guys. That's what I do. So let's talk about, um, we got some really good comments on the child labor video. So let's take a look at those. Um, sorry. Cool. 
Um, let me know which one comes up first for you. And yeah, people disagree with my hot take. Great. And also, people are disagree with my hot take. That's fine, guys. Because it's when I, whenever I say, I hope you guys know this. Whenever I say hot take, I, I'm basically saying that I'm probably wrong. See, Scarlett says I'm kinky, poly, and hot. You know what? Maybe Scarlett, maybe you're the exception that proves the rule. I don't know. But also, hotness is subjective. Here's another thing, guys. It's generational. Older millennials. Like, we, why am I talking about sex stuff today? I'll just say this. Older millennials came of age in an era where a lot of things that are normal and good, like like, like kinks and, and queerness and lots of stuff, weren't normalized. And to connect this back to Florida, I'm going, you know, I, I was a teenager in the late 90s and early 2000s in Florida. It wasn't like a kinky, queer plate. Like, you know, there wasn't a lot of openness towards that. So I do think a lot of younger people who especially like gen zers and stuff like that just grew up in a world where the, like the the broadness of what counted as as sexuality was, was just broader and more open so i think that's good um so there you go um <laughs> this is okay the chat got weird and that's my fault joshua yeah joshua agreed as an older millennial I ruined the chat today, guys. I ruined the chat. So let's talk about child labor. Do you guys think that's hot? If you keep talking about sex stuff in the chat, it means you think child labor is a turn on, and I think that's fucked. So just I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pay attention to the chat. But Joshua is a solid LA seven, Oklahoma City ten. That's rad. Yeah, I think I'm like a LA five, Midwest seven. If I'm going to be honest, um, but who knows? Uh, but we got to stop. We're talking about child labor now. Do you have some comments from the child labor video? Guys, I, this is the first time I've ever pinned a comment to be the top comment on a video. Normally, the top comment on a video is either one that a sponsor makes us do, or it's one that we just put up that's like, let us know what you think about this. Drive engagement. Feed the algorithm. This one is so good. I pinned it. Um, it's from Eric Sanwell Vice, and it says, 14-year-old. I cut off my hand cleaning a butcher saw. Mom's for liberty. But are you gay? Guys, this is one of the best comments we've ever had on a Wisecrack video. I mean, like, top, top notch. Top notch. Um, you know, that's what I got to say. Ah, um, I just love this. I'm just going to look at. Yeah. Okay, great. We're in the right order, so this is good. Um, here's another sort of conversational comment. They say, me in history class 25 years ago. Boy, am I glad I wasn't a kid back then. Me in 2023. Boy, am I glad I'm not a kid now. I like it. I, I, like, I like the format we're doing here. Uh, next one we got here. Um, guys, a little more intense. So if you keep saying sex stuff in the chat when I read this comment, it means you are a certified psychopath. Ocean Water says, I worked in a seafood processing plant in Alaska. Almost all the workers were migrant workers from Mexico. Some brought their families, and I worked with one kid who was 14 and his sister was 16. We had to work 16-hour days for less than minimum wage since they docked 20% of our pay for room and board. To get extra food, you needed to buy company tokens to exchange for extra snacks. It was a closed campus, so you weren't allowed to leave the bunkhouse unless it was to go to the grocery store and everyone else, and everyone else once every two weeks. Guys, this sounds like a work camp. Guys, this sounds like a... This sounds like a work camp um, where they where, where children work and they dock their pay. And if you need extra food, you buy company tokens. This is some like Dickensian England shit right here. Um, pretty dark, guys. Pretty dark. Yeah, I see. I see that the sex talk is really is really slowed down. Interesting. Interesting. Nope. No, it came back. You guys are all going to jail. OK. Um, this comment, someone said, dude, your channel went from just fun videos and pop culture to legendary breakdowns of the nightmares in our world. Listen, things change. People grow, they progress. Channels grow, they progress. And we're glad you're here for it. Um, this comment is from Dissonance Paradiddle said, funny how the crowd that always says, won't someone think of the children is real quiet about this. Yeah, there were some comments um, to that regard on this video. But again, that was the whole thing with the child labor thing that we thought was funny. Not funny, but like darkly funny, ironic that 
a lot of the people in America whose whole political project is like, think of the children. No, no, no. Or just like put them in factories. It's not good. Next comment from Lachlan says, as an adult who worked on a kill floor, I don't know what an abattoir is. Do you know what an abattoir is, Henry? Yeah, it's where they, uh, it's like for slaughtering uh, animals. Like, I believe it's okay, like, I, I, I don't I remember if it's specifically for pork. I don't know why I'm thinking that, but yeah, it's like, where, yeah. like they slaughter meat. Cool. Yeah, someone in the chat, let us know what an abattoir is in the chat and we'll take you off the government list. That's one way you can, so... For everyone who's just showing up here, um, we did reveal that this is a, a large scale psyop that we're using to um, guys Vox's comment. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> he went for it. He really went for it. Um, but this is a psyop. We're using data from the chat to keep a list of counter revolutionaries um, and to put to put you all in work camps. But when you help us out, you're off the list. So yes, everyone that just helped us that said slaughterhouse, you're off the list. You're free again. This person has an adult who worked on the kill floor of a slaughterhouse. No one under 18 should be there. It was one of the most dangerous jobs I've done. And like all jobs, not for everyone. I'm also furious that none of the workers blew the whistle, though. Yeah, there you go. Um, Drift King 305 says, yo, greetings from Miami, Florida. I'll be honest, even with all our problems, I choose Miami over everywhere every single time. 305 for life, baby. Listen, if it's good enough for Pitbull and DJ Khaled, who are we to disagree? Um, but yeah, and again, for anyone just showing up too, we're not here to like make fun of Florida. Florida's, I actually like Florida a lot. There's a lot of great people in Florida. And we all know that like a politician from a state is not representative of the people of that state. Um, this comment from Proof Rock says, I taught children from Central America who worked for farms and factories in Southern Indiana they were exploited and exhausted and had no time for schoolwork or community activities. They failed classes and were pushed through the system so that privileged kids could have fun and go into better things. Serfdom is alive and well in the United States. Yeah. I mean, again, like thinking about child labor, th there was a lot of a lot of this and it just sucks. It just sucks. You know, guys, it just sucks. And I don't know how else to put it but I'm glad that we all are aware of it. Scarlett Voss did point out that Pitbull is Mr. Worldwide who transcends states and countries. I mean, Mr. Worldwide is, is a model for all of us. You know, I think that in the Marxist tradition, there was this idea of, you know, a, a workers union that transcends all nationalities and, and workers being citizens of the world. And I really think that's what notable John McCain supporter Pitbull wants for all of us. Um, Penny Waldrop says, but we're a representative democracy, aren't we? But it's like, are we though? You know, and again, we don't talk politics. We don't do politics here. I have no political interest, but um, are we? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Next comment on here from, oh, let's see. So Evan said, is the reason child labor is returning because the idea of an innocent age is being overridden by the new age Protestant work ethic? Evan, that's a great question. I mean, so this week, and we'll talk about the debt ceiling later, um, but, you know, we like raise the debt ceiling and stuff like that which isn't, I'm not going to get into it too much because I'm not that good at economics, but it's like also not a real thing. It's just like not a real thing. But we raised the debt ceiling and Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House, said that, you know, so it lowers work requirements for young people and people on benefits. And Kevin McCarthy said this thing about how young people need jobs because it what it, it's what gives you value as a human. And I think to Evan's question about the Protestant work ethic, I think that when when we attach the idea of human value to the idea of work, we create a really dangerous precedent where people are not, because I think it, often in the school system, it's like people are valuable and children are valuable either because they are workers or because they are pre-workers, not because they're human beings, right? And we talk about how on the stream and at Wisecrack, we don't have politics. We just think that uh, empathy is good and everyone should have a nice life. And I think that Part of that means understanding that one's humanity is not attached to their profession or their ability to work. So I think that's the, uh, the dangerous side of that. Gordon asks the waiter, the child crisis actors in school shootings unionized? As a CIA representative, I can't answer that in particular. Um, but yes, Jackson Mayer's here and has a, a frowny face. Um, now, my brain just broke for a second. Because Jackson just put out a really good video, and now I'm trying to remember the topic of Jackson's most recent video. Jackson, uh, TV's going to change. 
Yes. Was there one after that? Jackson TV video was awesome. Um, I thought he had one after it. Maybe that was it. But yeah, Jackson's most recent video is great. Go uh, subscribe to Skip Intro. So this is a comment from Adam. It says, and you'll notice I, a lot of the comments from this video have the format of like the conversational thing. Adam said, what I used to think when Wisecrack uploaded a video. Oh boy, a cool video explaining the philosophy behind my favorite pop cultural media. What I think in 2023 when Wisecrack uploads a new video. Oh boy, a video that makes me feel emotionally devastated and hopeless about the current state of my country. Adam, glad to do it. Glad to do it. Um, I think the second to last comment, or maybe the last comment. Um, yeah, this one is, this video broke Michael in a way I've not seen before. And that makes me very sad. Thank you for the empathy, Will. See, empathy, a good thing. Thanks for being the one talking about this. Don't forget to look after your mental health. Thank you. I hope your bosses are giving you lots of support. So next, or that was the comments. That was the comment section, guys. Um, thank you for doing that. We like it. Oh, Julia's getting, I, I feel like Julia's talked about this before. As she broke up with her girlfriend rather than moving to Florida, but you're in Canada and Canada has a lot of, a lot of fun stuff, a lot of fun stuff going on. So why, why leave Canada is what I always say. Um, okay. So let's see. We did that. We're watching Wisecrack live and everyone knows this. I'll do a pitch real quick. If you like us and you want to support us, consider joining our Patreon. If you do not join Patreon, I still love you just as much. And you're just as valuable as a human just because of your humanity. Your ability to consume is not what makes you valuable. Your ability to become data is not what makes you valuable. Your humanity makes you valuable. Um, but if alongside that, you have 5 to $10 a month of U.S. currency that you could give us, we'll give you some stuff uh, in return and it supports the channel. So, you know, I'll say this two to three more times around here. Budget Ballin left a funny comment. I'm not going to read Budget Ballin's funny comment, but it's a good comment. Because I, you know, I, I got to not speak on something so I don't want to get fired. Um, okay, guys, let's get into this. Let's get into the Florida of it all. I'm going to load a video and, and immediately hit pause Elon Musk on it so it doesn't start. Code. Let me skip around this one because I think it's kind of long. But guys, Ron DeSantis, 2024. Here's the thing. We're not, this is not a politics stream. We don't do politics. Um, real quick, David asked some great questions. What makes a rock valuable? What differentiates us from animal? I mean, a rock becomes valuable either in its use value, right? We use the rock for something or in its market value when it becomes a commodity and we get like quartz out of it. Um, Davi then says, what differentiates us from animals? Um, a lot of people will say a lot of different things on that. Some will say it's our reason and our capacity for logic. Others will say it's our ability to like self-determine. So like an existentialist would say existence precedes essence. So what makes you interesting as a human is you don't have a built-in essence. You have an ability to self-determine that. Uh, some like a Kant or an Aristotle would say that your ability for reason um, is what does that. Someone in the psychoanalytic tradition might say it's your ability for anxiety and neurosis that makes you uh, especially human. Um, Ross, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Ross uh, just tuned in, asked what they missed, uh, caught the stream before you work a 12 hour at 7 p.m. That's intense. That's very intense. Um, so Davi says, isn't a thing's value defined by its usefulness? But but again, that's like using a form of logic and yeah, um, I mean, reclaimed Dasein got at this. Um, but yeah, we're, we're let's not go too far down that rabbit hole right now. But there you go. So again, we don't do politics here. Uh, empathy and good lives is all we care about. But Ron DeSantis is a part of our culture, whether we like it or not. And Ron DeSantis' presidential bid announcement coincided with our Lord and Savior Elon Musk and Twitter. And it was a total shit show, which is very fun. Um, so there you go. And again, I know there's a lot of, I don't want to get into the debate about like, here's the thing guys, can I just tell you that you're valuable because of your humanity and not just turn that into some debate? Can you just accept that? What makes you not want to accept that value? You know, I want you to think about that. If I say to you, you're valuable just because you're human and then you go, no, I'm not. It's like, why? 
you know, I'm not your therapist, right? This isn't better hell. I shouldn't say that. But, you know, you just maybe think about that. So let's check this out. And yeah, like the stream. I haven't been saying it, but it helps us a lot. If you like the stream, please like the stream, share it. If you're someone who is active on social media, you know, drop a link to it. It helps us out. We appreciate it. Let's check it out. Do you remember that time that billionaire Elon Musk unveiled the new Tesla Cybertruck? And when he went to demonstrate the vehicle's supposedly bulletproof glass, <laughs> they smashed two of its windows, even though they weren't supposed to break? Today's Twitter rollout of the Ron DeSantis campaign went kind of like that. We want to welcome you to this historic Twitter Spaces event and more broadly, a first in the history of social media. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to introduce two individuals who've done more to loosen the. I just want to note, guys, when the audio is cutting out on this video, that's just really what happened. That's just really what happened. It's not that our stream is fucked up, but there you go. Um, Dirkster, thank you so much. Sorry about that. We, we've got so many people here. So let's see. So they just keep crashing, huh? Well, it's certainly uh, an, an incredible honor to uh, have Governor DeSantis uh, make this uh, stark announcement. Yo, it was... <laughs> oh, so it was a shit show, guys. It was not good. It was not a good announcement. Also, the funny thing is, and I wanted to make a bitchy tweet from the Wisecrack account, and I didn't. But they were like, historic numbers. And like, more people have watched videos we've made about like an episode of Rick and Morty than watched that announcement. So like, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves here, kids. It was like 20 minutes of that. Trump had the golden escalator. Ron DeSantis got the world's most embarrassing 404 error. Over 20 minutes of technical difficulties. That sounded like this. That is how the Florida governor's big entrance in the Republican presidential primary will be forever remembered. Guys, if Henry was on that, it would have gone very different. I will just say that. Producer Henry would not have let that fly. Um, and also, if you're just getting here, this is Producer Henry's birthday stream. His birthday's in a couple days. So do drop some happy birthday love to Henry. Hit him up on social media and tell him you love him. That his life's valuable just because he's a human and also oh, a good producer. Thank DeSantis you. chose to launch his campaign, not during a campaign <laughs> rally, not on a televised event, um, RNDRX says, why are people still on Twitter? Scarlett Voss offered, because Twitter allows porn. But I'll also say, for some of us, like, I'm still on Twitter because I've been on it for so long. It's made up a big part of my, like, parasocial life. And I have a lot of friends from over the years who I mostly interact with via Twitter at this point. So there is, like, a safety in that for me. And I hate it. Like, ideologically, I'd love to leave it and do something else. But... I think that for me sometimes, especially because a lot of people I follow on Twitter are people whose cultural and political sensibilities I like, it can be a space of a little bit of an experience of like empathy or humanity when stuff happens in the world. And I'm like, am I crazy for thinking this is crazy? And I go on Twitter and people are like, oh, no, this is crazy. So, you know, that's, that's my answer. But on Twitter.com with Elon Musk and why? Maybe because Musk and Twitter are the best audience for the DeSantis brand crusade against woke. I view the wokeness as a form of cultural Marxism. The wokeness. I think it goes back to this woke mind virus that's infected the left and all these other institutions. We will never surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. Guys, we're going to make a video on this. Um, <laughs> like, and thanks for liking the stream. Thanks for being here. Ron DeSantis' obsession with wokeness is ridiculous. Oh, also, next stream, we have a guest coming on who's an expert in wokeness. I really mean that. So I'm very excited about that. Henry, I forgot to tell you. I'll talk about this later. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, a philosopher who literally all of uh, his work is kind of on why people like Ron DeSantis and James Lindsay and folks of that nature are idiots is going to come on. I'm very excited. But, you know, um, DeSantis' entire brand is like the wokeness. Blah, blah, blah. Some people on like the child labor video, people are bringing up the we're woke thing. And sometimes I'll comment back and say, what is woke? And they respond and say, define woman. I just like, what are you doing, guys? Yeah, it's like, what are you doing? That's, I don't, what are we, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, Casey Masterpiece says, is it Childish Gambino teaching us to stay woke? Well, again, guys, like, um, I don't want to get too into this because I don't know all of the history here, but woke 
in in recent incarnations i'm not saying like the whole history of the term but i was first made aware or i was first seeing the term woke um by some very smart and funny people on like black twitter who were primarily using the term woke to describe an awareness of systemic inequality, ideological racism and white supremacy, and wokeness being an ability to see what's going on, in a sense, staying woke in that very, I guess, like early sense, makes me think of whether it's like Plato or critical theory, the philosophical disposition of abstracting yourself from the immediacy of what you see around you and taking a critical lens to the system structures and material conditions that lead to those things around you. Very, very, very good stuff. Obviously then on Childish Gambino's Awaken My Love record, um, I think I think it's the song Redbone where the chorus you know says stay woke in it. Again, that's an album that's a tribute in many ways to experimental, like, like black experimental and funk music from the 70s. So it was... Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a, a classic example of, so normally it's like liberal white people who appropriate black culture and language and make it like hee hee fun. Um, you know, like anytime you just like, I'm not going to get too into it, but a lot of things like a lot of like white people say very casually are just like fully appropriated with no awareness from black culture. And it's like the woke thing is one of the rare cases where the right wing white people have appropriated a term largely from black culture. Yeah, it's just a very uh, – it's one of the most blatantly, like, clear tracers of how ideas uh, and fads just get stripped of meaning and just way too uh, overused by American consumption mindset. Yeah. So RNDRX in the chat said, woke is when Hollywood makes terrible movies. But here's the thing, right? The, the type of movies when people's like, Hollywood got woke. Hollywood didn't get woke because Hollywood is not asking big questions about systemic inequality and underlying material conditions that lead to this. What Hollywood's doing is literally doing a game of like, like moving chess pieces. And they're like, let's take this movie, but put a black person in it. Let's take this rom-com franchise and make it queer. Why are they doing this? Because they want to open up markets and have people buy shit. There is no politics involved in this whatsoever. It is consumer logic. It is cold, hard, Logan Roy type stuff. Um, we can maybe talk about succession later if you guys want. Because there's stuff to say there. But again, so when people say, blank got woke, it's literally just like, no, you're just mad that like someone put a black person in a movie. Like, dog. But, but, but let me say this too. Most of the movies and, and TV shows, people are like, oh, it's bad because it's woke. It's not bad because it's woke. It's bad because it's a cynical ploy to monetize identity to get us to buy shit. That's why it's bad, you know? Um, if we're going to say, like, what what would, like, real wokeness be? Like, I don't know, thinking more critically about the world around us. You could argue that in, like, a good way that a movie like Parasite, <laughs> you know, is woke. And it's one of the best movies of the last five years. Dog Named Cat says the rights definition of woke is whatever derogatory slur that is assigned to whatever minority they're obsessed with currently. There you go. Okay, let's keep watching a little bit more of this. Also, yeah, we're big cousin Greg stands here. We love the disgusting brothers. Now officially a 2024 contender is knee deep in this kind of impenetrable sphere of contemporary right wing online culture war fights. Fighting the woke mind virus aligns quite well with Twitter. Its new owner, Elon Musk, has turned the platform into a right-wing forum where he also rails against the woke mind virus, the same ideology embraced by DeSantis. The Florida governor is apparently trapped. If you, okay, guys, if you don't know how old Rod DeSantis is, if you know, don't say anything. If you don't know how old Rod DeSantis is, in the chat right now, how old do you think this man is? I don't think Chris Hayes is going to say it. Thank you for liking the stream, but please... Put put in the chat, you know, what it is. Also, by certain definitions of woke, like all of good 70s cinema is like woke. You, you could argue that like Easy Rider is woke. Even into um, the 80s, like RoboCop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Paul Verhoeven, for sure. Um, but yeah, someone said 49. Someone said 34. That's offensive. 47, 50, 43, 50, 54, 55. Okay, so we're getting people saying 30s. You guys are insane. Okay, so we're getting... Okay, a lot of people are accurately close. Henry, do you know how old Ron DeSantis is? I do not. How old do you think he is? 47? Mid, mid to late 40s. Right. 
Wait, I might be wrong now. I think he's like 42. Or maybe 44. But he's a lot younger than he should be. Um, I think it's fuck. Now that I now that I did this whole thing, I think it is for it's 44 or 42. Um, but yeah, he's just like way younger than he should be. Would someone Googled it? For whoever Googled it, which one BioYard did? Is it 44? Oh, yeah, yeah Google's 44. telling me okay. 44. Yeah, I just think he's like, that's just weird. I have friends that are 44 that are like cool guys. And to bring the, the conversation back, I have friends who are 44 that are pretty hot. You know, they're like hot, hot guys. <laughs> you know, Ron DeSantis, man, I don't know. Maybe becoming a politician just ages you. Because you guys know that Bernie Sanders is 49 and he looks like that. AOC is 12. You know, it ages you. I kid. Trapped in okay. this online. Yeah, Frank says he's 44, looks 56. And cultural woke bubble has chosen, for example, to fight with Disney for daring to speak out against him. Guys, if the enemy of my enemy is my friend, does that mean me and Ron DeSantis are friends because we both hate Disney? I don't know. Even one of his speechwriters, a guy that he chose to hire, has effusively praised notorious white nationalist Nick Fuentes. Oh, that's sick. He loves, he loves. I wonder if the speechwriter is the person someone in the chat was referring to. Yeah, Vox, you look way better than Ron. Vox is, I mean, Vox is going 48 year old, if I do say America. so myself. We Here, need... what's this? Let's watch this other video from The Guardian because I like the British perspective on American politics. And then we'll maybe look, we'll look at an article as well. Um, Joshua was, was Ubering in Tallahassee when his inauguration was happening, and GOP 50 year olds were like, he's very attractive. Julia says, I think being white and living in Florida ages you. Yeah, that's why I think it was kind of abusive that my parents made me move to Florida because my skin is not made for the sun. Recently, my doctor told me I just shouldn't be outside, which wasn't the best thing to hear. We showed that we can and must revitalize America. Oh, also, Ron DeSantis made hats for his campaign that say make America Florida. We again. need the courage to lead. And Thanks for liking the stream and being here. It means a lot. The strength to win. I'm Ron DeSantis. And I'm running for president to lead our great American DeSantis. comeback. Who talks like that? All right. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, everyone, depending on wherever in the world you're joining us from. I'm what an event. Live from David from Twitter. On the side, too, it's like, who's there? Tommy Loren, Laura Ingram, Ron DeSantis, Elon Musk. Just the who's who of people who are like, if you... I don't know if God got a lump of shit and gave it consciousness. Back here, uh, Elon is sitting next to me, and we want and we want to welcome you to this historic Twitter Spaces event, and more broadly, a first in the history of social media. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to introduce two individuals who've done more to loosen the. I know we want. Right, sorry about that. So we much. we've got so many people here that I think we are we are uh, kind of melting the server. Melting the servers at 258 people on a Twitter space. Sorry, 258,000. That's not a lot, guys. That's not a lot. Uh, which is a good sign. Um, and I love how they just framed it as like, we broke the internet with this historic thing. All right, I'd like to just introduce the the, uh, the folks in, in the room here. So it's safe to say we wouldn't be making history without the man sitting next to me, Elon Musk. His decision to purchase this platform last year to restore to its original mission as a beacon for free speech and even to expose Twitter's past complicity with a government censorship regime might have surprised many, but not those of us who've known and worked with Elon for nearly a quarter century. His commitment to freedom, commitment to freedom is his money where put his money where his, his mouth is, upset the narrative, upset the narrative of all the so by our government, elite institutions, and corporate media. Uh, go ahead and send a, a heart up if you want to say thank you, Elon. But, Send a heart up if you want uh, to say Governor DeSantis you, Elon. first drew my attention and support when I saw how he responded to the COVID pandemic and refused to believe what we now know to be the many falsehoods that government experts and their media mouthpieces were feeding us. Who else is, I just want to look in the side here. Tommy Loren, One America, Caitlyn Jenner. He kept Florida's schools open and its economy thriving while my state of California chose two years of learning loss and lockdowns that we have yet to fully. For sure. Also, the narrative, too. I love that DeSantis invoked like this narrative that like Florida was just thriving as California went into chaos. And this is not true. 
when the feed returned, Musk said Twitter's servers were being overwhelmed. Well, three... Like, you're Mr. Genius Man, man. There are 2,000 people, Lauren. All right, great. So, let's see. So it's not that many people yeah, got... for the <laughs> internet. Hey, just a massive number of people online, so it's um, servers are straining somewhat. Um, all right, we're just uh, reallocating more uh, server capability uh, to be able to handle load. Here. Oh yeah, it's uh, really going going crazy. So yeah, it's so um, nuts. Yeah, I'm obviously very excited to um, have uh, Governor DeSantis uh, make this. Uh, Feed so, cuts off. Can, are you there? Can you hear us? I think you're broke. <laughs> I'm right, here. I know. Exciting. I think I think you broke the internet there. We had over half a million people. I think you broke the internet. A half a million. It's not that a many people. people. In one Twitter space, and it was growing by like fifty thousand a minute. Casey's so, not uh, wrong. Congrats on uh, on breaking the internet there. <laughs> so Julia says, um, "Yeah, breaking the internet is crazy." I'm gonna be spicy here. Julia says, "Serious question: How does someone like Caitlyn Jenner support someone who's anti-trans?" Um, a lot of people in America and around the world have a primary allegiance to their class, more so than. Uh, communities grounded on race, um, gender, sexual identity, things like that. They primarily have a class allegiance. So I think someone like Caitlyn Jenner, the way that she views the world it is one that's mediated and marked by class uh, and economic relations. And that primarily, that primary allegiance she has to class is what aligns her more with someone like Ron DeSantis or the right than it would with left-wing people who are pushing, um, you know, uh, for inclusivity and liberation for for trans and queer people. Basically, that. I mean, it's the same reason why Caitlyn's uh, stepdaughters, you know, like someone like Kim Kardashian, who in many ways you would think, uh, because of other identity markers, might lean at least kind of liberal, is also pretty right-wing. So there you go. Yeah, uh, some people said this. In the chat as well. No, the the account can't be fake because we that's verified on Twitter, and Twitter verification is real. Um, do you want to pull up? Should we pull up that article about this? Oh, I think I thought you had one pulled up. That was the. Oh, were we gonna do? Hold on. Do you want to? Should we look at the AP article on the DeSantis thing, or do you think we've covered it? Yeah. And we got, yeah, we're going to look at a couple more Florida things. And we got more for you today, folks. Um, so, again, if you're just tuning in, this is Wisecrack Live. I'm Michael Burns here, as always, with Producer Henry on Producer Henry's birthday week. That's pretty exciting. Your birthday falls on a Saturday. Um, yeah, Karina also brings up that she also killed someone with her car. Um, so there you go. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so we have this article. Hold on, I'm going to decline some stuff from the AP. I don't want to sign up with you. Um, I'm going to close an ad about NFL star Rob Gronkowski's favorite shoes. Um, so just like a little bit of this article kind of on this. Thing. Uh, yeah, and Vox makes the point as well that like Caitlyn Jenner has long been a conservative. Uh, uh, okay. Guys, we're breaking the internet today. We're at 579. If we get to 666, the internet's going to blow up. So don't like the stream, because if you do, the algorithm might boost it and more people might watch and we might get to 666 and then the, the internet will be broken. It's from the AP. It says, Elon Musk wants to turn Twitter into a digital town square. But as much publicized Twitter spaces kickoff event with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis Announces, announces, announces his run for president, struggle with technical glitches, and a near half-hour delay Wednesday. The billionaire Twitter owner said the problems were due to straining servers because so many people were trying to listen to the audio-only event. But even at their highest, the number of listeners topped out at around four, nice, 420,000, far from the millions of viewers that televised presidential announcements attract. There's so many people said host David Sachs amid the disruptions. We've got so many people here that we're kind of melting the servers, which is a good sign. Melting the servers. 
After it concluded, without further disruption, Musk, DeSantis, and Sachs played off the event as a success with Sachs quipping, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And we finished really strong. Musk, a day earlier, dubbed the event a historic first for Twitter, saying it would be the first time something like this is happening on social media. The webcast was scheduled to start at 6 p.m. Eastern, but nearly 30 minutes passed, with users getting kicked off hearing microphone feedback, and enduring other technical problems before it finally began. Guys, we would never do this to you on Wisecrack Live. We would never, ever do this to you. Um, You, Willow, you, Wisecrack member, thanks for showing up. Also, remember, you can be a member if you want. You can. You don't have to. You don't have to. But you could be a member. It's a fun thing to do. Um, Someone said you should have gone on Joe Rogan. Yeah, a lot more people would have heard and seen it. Um... So DeSantis' opponents had a field day, uh, glitchy tech issues, uncomfortable silences, a complete failure to launch, and that's just the candidate, Whew, said Stephen Chung, a spokesperson uh, for Trump. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a Democrat from New York, tweeted, we had more people join when I played Among Us, referencing the popular video game. Guys, that's good. Regardless of what you think about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her politics. That's a good that's a good burn right there that more people wanted to play among us with AOC than wanted to watch DeSantis do that. Um, also, yeah, no, I think Dead Card 13 is probably the Lord of the Chat still. If you've ever wanted to be Lord of the Chat, it's just when you gift memberships. It's one of those fun things you can do if you just have some money to fuck around with. So if you have the money to fuck around with it, feel free. Twitter has suffered a host of technical issues since Mu- Ma- Musk, I almost called him Muck, took over and fired or laid off roughly 80% of its staff, including engineers tasked with keeping the site running. A day before the event, speaking at the Wall Street Journal CEO Council Summit in London, Musk expressed confidence about Twitter's future and said he's going to start adding people to the company. Um, and then we just got a lot of stuff about how Twitter has fallen apart. Um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit right here. Um, yeah, well, maybe let's let's let me cut. We'll cut the article off here. There's a lot of good stuff there. I want to look at one more Florida thing in the first hour of our of our journey together, guys. So, and we all we do hail the lords of the chat. Um, okay, guys. Yeah, hundred more. We got to get to six six six. Um, so, along with the Ron DeSantis debacle, also. We don't do political predictions. This is not a political show, whatever. But um, I don't think there's any way Ron DeSantis is going to be the president. I really, I really don't think that. Let's do a fun game. You don't have to be from America to do this. In the chat, who do you think will be the winner of the 2024 presidential election in America? I'm not asking you who you want to win. We're not doing politics. We're doing just straight up predictions. We're doing sports here. Who do you think, if you had to bet money on it, will be the president in 2024. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the current question. I want everyone to answer that because um, it's going to be weird and grim. But I want to talk about another Floridian, uh, a person named Rick Scott, who I'll get this video loaded. This one might be- Florida weird. Senator oh, Rick Scott. Video. Oh yeah, very loud. Sorry, it's, it's from a short. Someone said yay. Florida Arambe. Senator- Okay, let's see. Yeah, I just want to see if this this one might be a, a shitty clip so we can look at something else. But cool. This is a quick one, guys, but it introduces Rick, Rick Scott. Scott appears to be losing his mind with this ridiculous travel advisory. Warning that the state of Florida is, quote, openly hostile towards socialists, communists, and those who enable them, end quote. Now, in this announcement, Senator Scott None of you are allowed to go to Florida. A direct on a response list. to the Biden administration's attempts to erase capitalism and the system that has brought prosperity to Florida. That is also. Sorry if I got too so loud, everyone. From Senator Rick Scott, he Sorry, Alexa. Any attempts to spread the oppression and poverty that socialism always brings would be rebuffed by Florida's residents. And the former governor here in the state of Florida, turned senator, uh, says that attempts to spread socialism in North Florida will be met with laughter and mockery. Okay, so Rick Scott literally put out a travel advisory, like the sort of travel advisory you'd put out if it's like, oh, don't go to this country because a bad thing's happening. Don't go to this region because it's getting crazy. And it was a travel advisory that said Florida is hostile 
towards socialist communists and those that enable them. Again, if you ever like the stream, you are not allowed to get to Florida at the gates. They will kick you. They'll kick you right out. Um, we got a lot of, let's see. Wisecrack, the Wisecrack live community seems to think that Biden's going to win. Sadly, I agree with Vox Podcast. That's all I'll say. I agree with Dr. Christopher Maverick, PhD. You can look up his prediction if you want. Um, but yeah. So this is pretty fucked. And it's, it's like, it's both funny and fucked. And I don't know if it's more funny or more fucked. You could let me know what you think. But the idea that we were in a place in 2023 when someone would say that. And again, let me say this. If there was a super, thank you for looking at the stream, guys. If there was a super left-leaning state, and there's not, and that state was like, you're not welcome here if you're conservative fiscally or socially. I would just be like, I would also think that's really dumb. And, you know, I, I, should I quote this? I will say that I was recently at a professional event where someone who did not grow up in America commented on how the most insane part of the American political system is the two party situation rather than a bunch of different parties with a diversity of opinions. But like the idea, especially like socialism, a position that's not really crazy and is pretty normative in a lot of the world it, it is just something we can't even talk about is really bad. That's just not a good thing. That's just not a good thing. Someone said, California, what do you mean? California is not liberal guys. Um, California just isn't uh, the real estate developer lobby literally runs the state along with influence from Silicon Valley and Hollywood. None of those are, are super liberal uh, industries. Um, so I'm going to say that, yeah, just cause like I, the thing I think people are like, Oh, California is liberal because like you're allowed to be gay there or something. It's like, not just like a, a place. It's just like a place. <laughs> where you know you can just be a person um but it's definitely not a liberal or left place um i would be broadcasting from a much nicer home if it was um so then i think what happened after this and we'll look at a news clip is the naacp then had to issue a travel advisory NAACP in response to this um, we'll get this clip Florida loaded just days before the as we continue weekend. our journey into the joys of the sunshine state NAACP. NAACP has issued a travel advisory for Florida just days before the Memorial Day holiday weekend. Controversial new laws have led the group to claim that black lives are, quote, not valued here. Local 10's Glenna Milberg is live with reaction. Glenna. Nicole, we already met visitors who are here for Memorial Day. These stanchions for the weekend were brought in just a few hours ago. A lot of people really have. Is it, a, is it a Memorial Day party for cattle? Why do they need A lot of people this? really haven't heard about this travel advisory just yet, but. Oh, some of you in the chat said you're from Miami. So let me know if you have thoughts on this, on this uh, channel. Businesses have, and they are bracing. And from black owned businesses, the reaction is a bit more complicated. At historic Dunn's Josephine Hotel in Overtown, African-American history is baked into the experience that culturally diverse clientele come for. I support it. I really do. I think that, you know, we have to make a stand as African-Americans about our history. Owner Kristen Kitchen gives voice to black business owners who both support the NAACP travel advisory and may also face its effects. If there is an economic impact to us, we need to make those kinds of sacrifices in order to make change. The advisory is right there on the front page of the NAACP website and details the protest over new state laws it calls anti-civil rights, like restrictions on African-American history lessons and roadblocks on diversity and equity training. The name Ron DeSantis is on their thing. Fingers he made pointed a bunch of those squarely stuff. at the governor. Is business worried? The Florida Chamber of Commerce had no comment on the advisory, but wrote Florida moved to number one in the U.S. for black owned businesses. We would implore them to make that investment in Miami because they will be investing in a lot of the same constituents that are represented by some of those. What's the vibe in Miami these days? That's always some Oops. Miami people. Too soon to see signs of a travel advisory effect here on South Beach. Did you hear about the NAACP travel advisory? <laughs> guys look at this person's hat it says girls are drugs that's a really cool hat i want to see what their shirt says because it probably also says something cool i have not no <laughs> but there are signs that visitors are paying attention really they wouldn't want me to spend my money here if they wouldn't want me here 
Okay, I think there's another. Is this like a news clip the we NAACP also have? The NAACP is issuing Let's a see. travel advi travel advisory about the state the of Florida. Same the civil rights thing. organization said in a statement that Florida is. Okay, cool. Do you think it's worth looking at as well? Yeah. Um, so again, guys, Florida. Oh, we're at the halfway point here. Um, girls are drugs. Um, and boys are, I don't know. But yeah, guys, it just, it's weird. And I, I don't love that Florida. There's a lot of things to say here. One thing to say, there's this annoying thing that's happening now where sometimes you talk to people who think of themselves as like good liberals, lefties, whatever. And they're just like, oh, Florida's bad. It's, we should lose them as a state, da, da, da. Which I don't like how that feels because I, I know a lot of you uh, in the chat here from Florida. I still live in Florida. You know, it's it's always sad when people are sort of like, oh, sick. Do we have we have a troll in the chat? Um, Dems are morons. Mephisto Center, this is going to bum you out. Um, yeah, of course they are. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think you're I don't think you came to the right place if you think uh, a lot of people in this chat are about to freak out and be like, no, we would die for uh, Democratic politicians because, um, again, we don't do politics here. And also, uh, Mephisto Center, what we mostly do on this stream is basically a honey trap for potential Antifa. And we try to get Antifa here. We get them to identify themselves and then we destroy their lives. So I think we're probably on the same page. So glad you're here and you can be a part of this Antifa honey trap. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's a weird little, it makes me sad for people who live in Florida that it has to be used as a little test case um, for a lot of, sorry, for like a, a new type of right-wing attack on lots of things. And of course, like some of the reasons why at Wisecrack we care about this is a lot of this implies a sort of ta an attack on education, an attack on critical thought, an attack on the critical humanities, on history, on philosophy, on critical theory. And it's, it's very, it's a bummer. What's the honey lemon thunder says producer Henry honey pot is the term Scarlet boss says. Thank you for correcting me. Um, but we could also be a, a honey trap. Um, yeah, Angie Bear, you're Antifa. You're done. You're done. Okay, guys? Brandon wants to be part of Antifa. You're done. This is basically, this stream is like if Roman Roy started his own YouTube stream. Uh, we'll just hint at succession. We won't get super into it. But think of me and Henry as Roman Roy and a friend. Think uh, This is President Mencken's stream. Um, let's see any, yeah. Haruna Matata wants some, um, extra adrenochrome from some Democrats. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Um, LEB says, I don't want to lose Florida. My whole family lives there. I want to live with them. I can't live with them because my children's safety is too important. It's a weird one too. Like I, uh, you know, a lot of you know this, I'm on the, the cusp of having a kid and one of my kids, grandparents and, and aunts live in Florida. And it's not like I think they're going to start like checking for papers at the borders, but I don't know. It's a, it's a weird, it's just a weird vibe there. Um, customer says as a Floridian, I am indeed dying. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joshua says we're moving out of the state to protect our trans son. Yeah. So it's kind of what I'm getting at thinking about like parenting type stuff. Like that just sucks. Like I wouldn't want to raise a kid someplace where the state was actively hostile towards them. That's just a horrible vibe um karina says as a floridian i'd like to not decide the presidency for once maybe you guys just take one you take one um you know election out um yeah s co says born and raised in miami and now live in broward this is a fun show to watch the hate florida gets is hilarious where the most gays out of san fran and blacks are not being hunted shocker um i'm confused confused about what that means but florida is like a super diverse state so there you go. Um, you Willow says can confirm FBI showed up a few minutes after I became a member and now get in the custody. Yes. So you Willow guys paid money to warn you. I'm assuming that one of the agents gave them that money. Um, you're all fucked. Um, Jello shots gifted five memberships. If you do give memberships that will ease your sentencing. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Brandon Harwichi says, why does want you to risk your life by fighting corruption and voting in Florida? Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should all move to Florida together. Just, just take it over. Um, 
Okay, so again, we're we're watching Wisecrack Live. Thanks for being here. I'm Michael Burns. Producer Henry, his birthday is this weekend. Please say happy birthday to Producer Henry. If you haven't, please consider gifting some memberships just because it's fucking fun. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can join our Patreon. I'll just like tell you what's on the Patreon again in case you don't know. The big, I would say the biggest attraction for the Patreon is that for $5 a month, you get all the videos early with no ads. Many of you just fucking hate the ads and it's fine. I'm not mad at you for that. We talked about it a couple streams ago. Um, but if you don't want to watch ads, five bucks, I think I, I did the math before, but you're paying five bucks for eight videos. Is it like a dollar twenty a video or something like that? It's pretty good. It's a pretty good rate, you know, for what you get. Um, you also get access to our Discord server, which is fun. Uh, I I enjoy it. It's the the main Discord server I look at, uh, and we get some extra content as well, audio and video stuff when we make it. It's a little bit inconsistent. Dead card is definitely more to the chat right now because Dead card has done multiple giftings, so. You know, some of these check out if you want. I don't know. But yeah. Um, and, you know, make Florida weird again. Florida was more fun when it was weird. So let's see. Maybe. So someone recommended. Do you remember who recommended? Was it Penny Waldrip who, who recommended the work video? Yes. The second thought video. Yeah. So I'm wondering. We could do. We have that. Sorry for out loud guys talking about what, what we're going to do next. And we also have that. The that essay on equality we've been talking about looking at for a while. Let's do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm pulling that up right now. Um, on my end, you did on your end. Let's read. Let's learn guys. Do you want to learn? Is it time to learn? Um, so we talk a lot about freedom, equality, empathy, things of that nature. And and the Boston Review has an essay from the philosopher William M. Paris that's kind of on some of the stuff we've been talking about. And um, I've looked at this a few times. I've, I haven't read the whole essay, but I did think like, oh, man, this might be really cool for some of the stuff we talk about. So let's go to class, guys. Let's read. Let's learn. Let's become smart. And then, oh, so Penny said it's kind of a downer. So we're going to read for a little bit. And then we're going to watch another video. So there you go. Um, you're a member if you're if you're uh, if your username is green. Oh, you know what we forgot to do? Let's get the Tate tweet up first. Oh, okay, yeah. That's our that's our our post Florida palate cleanser, guys. Is a little Andrew Tate. Sorry, I, where did I put it? I want to make sure I get it up so I can. I want to be able to accurately read it, guys. We don't normally promote Andrew Tate on the stream. Um, because we don't we don't even be deserve to be in his presence because he is the top G. Um, but also, if you want to recommend a new top G, let us know. But this is too good to not mention. So this is the thing that Andrew Tate tweeted. He said, life hack. Live with men you're in competition with, and you will become a predator. First of all, in the modern parlance, I think when someone says predator, we all think sex predator, right? Right? Oh, That's yeah, definitely sex pestery is a word. <laughs> Yeah. So, so like live with men you're in competition with and you'll become a predator. And then he goes, step one, get a four bedroom house, move in with an athlete, a millionaire businessman, a philosopher. So let's just think about this practically. I That's his like ideal D&D um, &D party. Yeah. So I'm I'm buying a four bedroom house. So I got to get some money for that. And then I guess I'm going on craigslist and i'm like wanted three roommates qualifications one of you has to be a top level professional athlete the other has to be a quote millionaire businessman the other has to be a philosopher please send over your information what the what in the flying fuck here guys i mean if you're a professional athlete or a millionaire businessman, you don't need roommates. Now, a philosopher might need roommates. I'll give him that one. I will give him that a, a grad student in philosophy, a, a writer, a teacher, an adjunct professor. Yeah, you're going to be having roommates. So, but, and then he says, take room four, get some self-respect and hold your own. But what does that mean? So let's say my athlete I move in with is a professional cyclist, a Lance Armstrong type. How do I hold my own? Do I do I ride my bike really fast next to Lance Armstrong? 
How do I hold my own against the millionaire businessman? Now, the philosopher, I think I can handle myself. Um, and then the final part is it says, don't accept bitch position. Is that a thing? If you live in a four bedroom house, someone has to have bitch position. I've never, I've lived in a three bedroom house and a fourth bedroom house. Um, Vox says, so this is like the real world, world starring Burns, LeBron James, Elon Musk, and Andrew Tate. And that crew, I would say, clearly LeBron and I are becoming friends. Um, but guys, this is just ridiculous. Someone said Tiger Woods, Kevin, Mark Cuban, and Michael. Uh, and then, I, so what I'm, in, what I'm most interested in here is like, I totally get why an Andrew Tate type would be like, you need an athlete because to be top G, you got to be strong. Fair. Millionaire businessman to be top G, you got to have that money. Fair. Philosopher? Like we want to, we want to think critically about the world around us. We want to, well, the numbers went up. We're almost, we could get to 666 soon. We, it's like, we, we want a philosopher in the Tate house. What is the philosopher going to do? Are we supposed to question our values and beliefs? Are we supposed to abstract from what's in front of us to think critically about systems and stuff? Like, what does, what does Andrew Tate think a philosopher is? Someone, you know, we posted this on our Twitter and someone said he means Jordan Peterson by philosopher. But like, what does he mean? I mean, for those of you, I'm curious in the chat, who would be the best philosopher living or dead to make Andrew Tate live with? Um, I mean, part of me thinks Schopenhauer would be funny. Um, or you get one of the weird Greeks, um, like one of the real weird Greeks. I don't know. Like who, if anyone has thoughts on this, I'd just be curious. Yeah. Remember to like the stream. If you don't like the stream, we're going to, the government after they arrest you for being Antifa is going to put you in a house with him. Also the ratio on this tweet currently is pretty good in that, um, 3.2 million views, 19,000 likes. That's not that's not that's not a good ratio, guys. Nineteen thousand likes might seem like a lot, but when we're talking about over three million views, that's not good. Someone said young. Someone said Nietzsche. Socrates would be really great. They would hate him. Yella says Michael Burns. I feel like they would kill me. I really feel like they would kill me. I don't want to live within a house with Andrew Tate. He'll kill me. Um, yeah, Vox says he doesn't mean Jordan Peterson. He specifically means a liberal intellectual PhD. Heidegger would seem up his alley in some metrics. Um, Heidegger was in the Nazi party. So I think that's what he means. I don't know. Maybe we put in, I mean, I don't want to say a woman philosopher because that just, I don't, I would not want to put her in the predator house. You know, I'm not trying to put anyone I care about in the house of predators. But yeah, just some guy without a mustache says, I watched your tenant video and it was the biggest piece of dog shit that I've ever heard. I don't give a fuck. I didn't host her write that video. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. <laughs> sure, man. I don't, I wasn't there for that one. So you have fun. Ooh, Enrique Dussel, um, Philippe. Enrique Dussel is a great philosopher. Uh, I like him a lot. Um, but yeah, man, Dussel would be great. Although again, do I want to put a really good Latin American leftist philosopher in danger in the predator house? I don't know if I want him in the Predator house. Ayn Rand, that's the only woman thinker who it seems we could put in there who would like hold her own because she'd be like, actually, I think Das is right. Um, yeah, guys, but I mean, Tate House, right? Tate House. So let's check out his article. Um, let's see. Terrence McKenna, Camus versus Tate. So let's check out his article. It, it is from last month, but you know, guys, a lot's been happening. Um, and this is from. Again, William M. Paris. Let's do some reading. So, and we can keep talking about Tate House, of course. Um, the Predator House. L just again, I'm going to get to this article. Move into a house with a bunch of men and make each other predators. <laughs> the fuck, man? Oh, but then it just makes me really sad that there's a bunch of young men who pay this guy a lot of money to make them men. It's really sad. Um, I've been working on a video about it for a while maybe we'll get to it chris hansen that's who you want that's who you want okay thanks for being here thanks for liking the stream let's read this article guys let's learn together let's be learners you know let this is what tate would want us to do andrew tate would want us together reading philosophy learning becoming predators so let's become intellectual predators starts by saying i was recently reading robin dg kelly's magnificent book freedom dreams black radical imagination when it came across this conclusion that high expectations begot the civil rights movement. 
The movement's marches and sit-ins were often interpreted as struggles for equality. These men and women were fighting for a just society where their status as equals would be affirmed. And this is, you know, interesting right off the bat, because I do think when we talk about what we're into in terms of ideas, uh, it, it's as simple as empathy and equality, no, no other radical ideological stuff besides that, and also living in predator houses. On this view, equality, or at least a less unequal society, is an outcome to be established. But Kelly points out that equality is not only an endpoint for social progress, it is the spur of social action. In other words, equality is more than a status to be attained. It is a present expectation. To refashion Marx and Engels of the German ideology, we might say that equality is not a state of affairs to be established, but the real movement to transform the present state of things. Um, that's a really interesting framing, right? We talk about equality, empathy, all these sorts of things. Um, and, and I think that like, to think of equality not as a state of affairs, but a movement to transform things, really clutch. Because then it's, when we think of equality as like just a thing that can happen on top of the world as it already exists, we're then not asking the question about the conditions materially and socially in the world that already exists that preclude that sort of equality. So I think that's a really good question. Again, these are the sort of questions that I'm going to bring up at family dinners at Predator House. Um, it also really felt to like the second we talked about Andrew Tate for 10 seconds, numbers went up and a bunch more trolls came in here. Do they know? You know what I mean? Does it, do the Andrew Tate heads just know when he's being discussed? It's his Is matrix it like, powers. Like he knows how to manipulate space and time. Oh no. Yeah. We just like looked at Andrew Tate tweet for five seconds and all of a sudden like the numbers went up and people were just like, you got you, your shit. You're, you're fucking shit. Well, you know what? Andrew Tate doesn't want you in his house. He didn't talk about you. He didn't say, oh, move in with one uh, angry commenter with, a, with, with an emoji for a user face to the name. No, he said he wants a philosopher there. So I'm going to be in the predator house and you're not. Okay? So eat shit because <laughs> I'm going to the predator house. Let's keep reading this. Christine Simpowich outlines various arguments philosophers have given an answer to the question of quality of what? Which is good, right? I mean, this is... To, to be boring here, guys, uh, the most boring or very practical part of philosophy is stuff like that. Someone's like equality, and you're like, yeah, but equality of what? Okay. She argues, rightly in my opinion, that we ought to think of equality as equality of humans flourishing rather than equality of opportunity. This is important too, right? Because I think, again, we have our two political principles at Wisecrack Live, empathy and everyone should have a good life. And I think that the second option here, right, equality of opportunity is basically like neoliberal equality. Everyone should have equal opportunity to, to participate in the machinations of the market or something like that. Whereas equality of flourishing is sort of like everyone should have equal opportunity for education, care, creativity, things like that. I agree wholeheartedly that we would do well to be reminded of the truly radical implications of the egalitarian ideal. But I would like to shift the focus away from the ideal that offers us a standpoint from which to judge society and the goal that we can approximate. Equality is also fundamentally a matter of shaping the horizon of expectations for social relationships. Do people think equality is, is bad? Are there people who just like think that, you know what I mean? To think equality is bad? I don't know. Yes, I do want to be in the predator house. Um, I think there's still like some of that red scare mindset of like communism means like uniformity of a thought and equality for everyone makes some people less equal. Like, yeah, there's that kind of reactionary yeah. take on it. Yeah. I mean, that would be like, and even the related to the Florida stuff we've been talking about, I guess like real equality mean as well, like, well, equality for socialists to express their ideas or whatever it might be. Um, Candy Fied says, equality of opportunity without some form of redistribution is impossible. An orphan is never going to have opportunity equal to, say, Jeff Bezos's children. Yeah. Anderson says the best equality is equality of chores for house maintenance. Saves marriages. That sounds fair. D Davi, thanks for showing up. Really appreciate it. Um, Gordon says equal opportunity to be bankrupted by medical cost. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Org put in two bucks for rent at Pred House. Thank you so much. I think it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. Um, narcissists think equality is bad. Um, 
let's see. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, Maeve says, yes, they're called Christian nationalists. Vox is good at talking to trolls. Um, I don't know if that's what you want to be good at, but you are. Okay, so let's go back to this article, starting with, equality is an intrinsically social concept. I can only be equal vis-a-vis -vis others. And this is important too, right? Like thinking of equality as something that involves our relations with others and not something that happens to others as abstracted from me, right? And we can crowdfund rent for Pred House. Unlike freedom, which we can conceive of as a property of an individual, equality saturates the expectations we have of how we conduct ourselves with one another. A lone person on a deserted island, shout to Tom Hanks, may or may not be described as free, but they certainly could not have any expectation of equality. It is only within a society that equality and inequality present themselves as problems. I would go further and say that egalitarian, the, the, uh, I would go further and say that the egalitarian ideal emerges from the real inequalities of social life. And like, again, this is, this is important um, because it's bringing up this idea that the concept of equality is not something that's abstract. It's something that's social and necessitates thinking about relations between others. I mean, this is like philosophy always ends up getting, and we talked about this in a recent video. We've talked about this on stream. That's why it always ends up getting vaguely social and political because it's hard to think of concepts like this abstracted from existing individuals. Um, Greta versus Predator. Guys, we can't put Greta in the Predator house. That's a, she's a child, man. That's a child. Can't do it. Can't do it. Um, who would be, I'm trying to think if there's any athlete that would go in Pred house. Oh, there's some. There's some baseball. There's some professional baseball players who I think would want to go in the Predator house. I don't think any NBA players would want to go in the Predator house. God bless them. Okay, so um, let's see. Penny says, I think Andrew Tate should be forced to live in a house with a dead philosopher. Penny, I wonder if you mean we're bringing a dead philosopher back to life or just he has to live in a house with a body, a bunch of dead bodies of philosophers. I'm just, just the corpses of philosophers. Oh, sorry, she's 20, my bad. That was infantilizing of me, I apologize. Um, any movement to transform society begins from the sting of inequality. I could not feel anger at an instance of unequal treatment if I did not have the expectation of being treated as an equal. Without this expectation of equality, I may naturalize and rationalize unequal treatment as just. In My Bondage and My Freedom, Frederick Douglass argues that the attainment of literacy irrevocably altered his expectations on how others ought to treat him. It is from the painful separation between how others treat me and the expectations I have of others that the egalitarian ideal acquires motivational force. And this is interesting, too, because, you know, we did talk Kyrie Irving. Yep, Paul got it. Great call. Um, Kristen Cinema in the house. Good call. Oh, yeah. Dennis Robin might, too. Um, Evan in Science says, so I asked a bit earlier, and sorry that I missed that, Evan in Science, why Americans put freedom higher than equality. Is it because of its historic roots? Um, that's a good question. I'm curious what others in the chat think. When I think about Americans putting freedom higher than equality, I think there's an inherent individualism at the heart of the American ideal. And I think that it's very much like an I, not a we thing. So I think the American conception of freedom is very much my freedom to do what I want and you can't tell me what to do. And I think that's different than, let's say, the conception of freedom you get with the French Revolution, right? I think in the French Revolution, and we're not saying everything that happened is good, the conception of freedom you get in the French Revolution is very much a collective freedom. Um, the idea of a societal freedom in which we are all free to do things collectively and form a different world. So that, that's at least how I would think of it in one way. And I think even related to this article on equality, I think a lot of people in America, God bless them, the Christian God bless them, don't necessarily understand how much freedom is is an intersubjective concept that's tied to others and i also think people sometimes mistake the distinction between freedom from with freedom for so in america it might be like freedom from the government telling me what to do freedom from the librarian telling my kids that penguins can be gay rather than freedom for human flourishing freedom to have housing, freedom to have access to education, all those sorts of things. Um, yeah. Any, any freedom thoughts, Henry? 
Yeah, uh, I think Americans, too, haven't had the same kind of social reconciliation as, say, like the French or the Germans. Or there's several Europeans with social democracy that are landlocked countries where they had to, like, look amongst Mm -hmm. each other and figure out how they were going to organize with, like, limited space. Whereas American history is littered with pushing problems westward and never really uh, reconciling that with our social fabric in a modern sense. Yeah, dude, well put. Oh, also, Kenny Powers from Eastbound and Down... Is Eastbound and Down is in the chat as user HTP. Freedom means having the right to ride a jet ski on the freeway. I can just hear Danny McBride saying that. Um, so let's keep going. But that's a really good question, um, Evan and Science. I'm glad you asked it again. And also, too, if you ever, especially my green friends, if you ever ask something and you really want to like, and you feel like we ignored it, ask it again. You know, don't don't be bashful. There's a lot happening on the chat. It's just two of us, you know, so keep doing it. Thanks for being here. Like the stream. Like the stream if you like discussing ideas and getting into it together. So the article goes on. Kelly or the essay, I think. Um, let's see. Well, M- Mr. Gertz says, freedom comes from God. The Constitution cements it to prevent the government or any foreign entity from getting in the way of freedom. But then see, Mr. Gertz, I, I feel what you're, I get what you're saying there. You could say that like God gives you know, the concept of God gives people a type of subjectivity and freedom. That's great. But if we're going to use God, right, we'd have to say that in both the Old and New Testament, God is always describing freedom and humanity as a collective entity, especially in, you know, the New Testament, we get to the book of Acts, the church starts forming. And what is the first thing that the church does in the book of Acts? They, um, you know, sell all their possessions and share things among each other as a community. So in, in a Christian concept of freedom, it seems like freedom is inherently collective because, you know, you have the Last Supper and it's like, have my body, have my blood. We are a community centered around this one ritual. What is, you know, the whole concept of, of church and Christianity, a communal existence centered around a shared set of values. So I think that even if you're going to say, Mr. Gert, that like freedom is from God, and maybe you don't mean um, in a Judeo-Christian sense, and I'm sorry if I'm I'm presuming that, then we would still have to say um, that freedom is a collective and a communal thing and not an individual thing. Cause we don't, we don't get that. Um, and maybe if someone in here is better on theology than I am, you could correct me, but, um, I, I'm pretty, so, Oh, happy birthday, Alexa. Birthday gang. Yeah. Happy Alexa birthday, Alexa. And Henry birthday party. Um, but yeah, but again, Mr. Gert or anyone else, let me know if you think I, uh, I, I was being unfair or sort of misstating how, how freedom functions in a Judeo-Christian perspective, because I'm trying to take everyone seriously in here. Um, okay, so let's get back to this article. Kelly focuses on the importance of dreams because it is from the expectations drawn from a society that does not yet exist that we become the sort of people who can recognize the bitter sting of inequality. That's very, very very well put. Um, It might be thought that we do not need dreams to know when we are being treated unequally, that we respond spontaneously to treatment that violates our innate sense of dignity. But I think this response confuses the dignity we may have as human creatures with the active recognition that our dignity entitles us to certain expectations of how others may treat us. Our sense of dignity is historically and socially developed, even if we allow for the idea that we naturally are equal creatures. Just checking with the chat real quick. So Mr. Gertz says, we're all together, we are all free. The community isn't attached physically. The community is shared between those who believe in God. Yeah, but wouldn't, but if we say it's not attached physically, and it's once again, depends on one's interpretation of things, but in Christianity, the sacraments, right, at least historically, um, are meant to have this, this communal thing. And there's, even at the heart of Christian theology, right, it's not just God, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a, a three-part intersubjectivity that models this sort of thing, which I think is is really interesting. Um, but again, we can have different different conceptions of these things. Um, Mr. Gerd also says the country is founded in Christian values. The country and community are all the same. I guess so, um, but not all the the founding fathers were were Christians in that sense. But and Mr. Gerd says we help each other not because our government helps us, but because we love each other. Yeah, and then the missing link right after says food, shelter, clothes, healthcare, and the like. So again, I, I do think that if 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 religious freedom in America meant that it was the primary concern of the you know 
over 50% of Americans that identify as Christians to take care of their community. I don't think anyone would have a problem with anything. So, you know, I, I hope that, I hope that happens. Matthew says, I think the idea of free is something that doesn't exist. To me, there's no such thing as free will. I don't think we shouldn't try for equality, but accepting that idea makes you free. I get what you're saying there, that the idea of some sort of like pure freedom. Wait, Dirkster says Judeo-Christian is a no-no. What, I wonder what that means. Um, I'm sorry that I, if I fuck something up. Wait, Henry. Is, yeah, someone. So is it? Do we not say, guys? I'm old. I'm older than somebody. I, yeah, I'm not is it bad sure to say well. Judeo-Christian? Um. Yeah. Please, please explain it, Dirkster. I want to mess it up. I guess. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um. I, I was trying to speak of monotheistic religion in an American context. It's grounded in either the Old Testament or the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, so again, if that was like a, a weird or bad thing to say, hey, we're all learning, guys. We're all learning. And I love to be uh, told that I was that I was wrong. But also, too, yeah, when, when people say like America was founded in Christian principles, it's kind of hard because because, you know, I, I don't know how you especially in a Christian context, and I'll just say Christian New Testament context, how you would, yeah, Abrahamic. Yeah. Is that what I, what I should have said there? Please let me, Dirkster, please let me know. I, I generally want to, you know, um, but you know, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say that America was founded in a, in a rigorously Christian context when s slavery was an inherent part of the early American project. It's just, it's hard to square that circle is all that I would say. It's always time to learn. And I always want to learn. Um, but you know, someone also brought up, um, and people are talking about this in the chat, this idea that, um, okay, so Abrahamic faiths. Great. Thank you. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say that from now on. Thank you so much for teaching me that you guys. Um, oh, an exclusionary dog whistle. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, that makes and, sense. Yeah. Oh, I get what you're saying. Cool. Well, and, and I, I would hope that, that you all, and I, I, and I appreciate you telling that, and I'm going to assume, um, that everyone in in this this chat knows um that i didn't mean it in a dog whistly way um cool Dirks, thank you so much i uh, appreciate that and again hopefully i'm pretty confident that anyone who's ever been to the stream before knows i was not trying to do an exclusionary dog whistle because in the predator house we don't exclude um but someone also to bounce around a little bit um you know when we talk about freedom and someone was talking about like, there's no true freedom. I mean, there's something interesting there, right? Cause it gives us this dialectical idea. And this is, or I'm working on a video that we're going to put out soon on existentialism. But um, one of the, the interesting things in the history of existentialism, we're bouncing around, but this relates to the article is that early existentialism is like, Oh, we're just free. We're free to be whoever we want. And then later in his career, Jean Paul Sartre is like, Oh my God, I can't believe I wrote some of that shit. Well, why is Sartre like this? Because later in his career, he recognizes the necessity and facticity that we can't control. He recognizes the way that we are unfree. So what freedom becomes for the later existentialist and, and that moving into a different type of philosophy is understanding the dialectical relationships between our operations as free consciousness, but that exist in a world that is determined by external factors outside of our control. So what we are is the, the kind of like dialectical navigation of those things, if that makes sense. So I do think it's an, important to think about freedom in that kind of contradictory context. Um, Howard has a super chat. This is after World War One and Two, Europe was destroyed. They rebuilt their society more collectively to take care of each other. U.S. won both wars without losing much and never saw a reason to reorganize our system. Definitely. Um, okay, That's... yeah, and Vox brings up. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say uh, Howard's comment. That's something you can really see in like the, the pop culture output of all the nations, like especially like European film history versus American. Uh, just the way yeah. just the way media was used by two different two different continents to reconstitute themselves after the war. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah, Scarlett Voss says instead we built suburbs. Scarlett Voss, I don't know if you've been in the if you've been in streams before, I, you're really just, you're doing a great job in the chat today. I just want to encourage you. Great contributions. And everyone is, but really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, and I'll, I'll try to get updated on saying the right terms as we get. Someone says, is it better to be a member here or a Patreon? Honestly, I say if you're going to do one, probably Patreon. Um, 
but they're just different things, I guess. I would say if you're someone who's mostly here just for live and chat and all this sort of stuff, then maybe do the membership thing. Um, Patreon, we get more money directly and you get some more perks. They're both fun though. Um, but no, the film point that Henry's made is, is really great. Again, happy birthday, Henry. But yeah, I mean, watch European cinema from the 60s and watch European and American films from the 60s. You know, America has this triumphant sort of thing and European cinema has this self-examination about the fragility and horrors of humanity. Got um, bicycle thieves, 400 blows, all that, like, who are we kind of like cultural uh, wondering? Yeah. A hundred percent. Let's see. Yeah, Julia, sometimes you need to do an urban planning uh, slideshow for the stream. That would rip. Um, let's see. And Vox says, the thing about Judeo-Christian is that it's hegemonically Christian. I'm not Abrahamic. It's not Abrahamic. It's just a Christian cultural Christian except Judaism, but excludes Islam. Yeah. So, oh, fuck. Michael, I got to look at that shirt. Thank you for reminding me. Last week was a weird one for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, again, and, and everything I was saying before about freedom, and, and I'll even just say this, like a lot of what I was saying about a sense of shared freedom is a thing that is drawn from uh, the, the New Testament of the Bible. And I hope that's okay to say. Um, okay, let's see. And then, yeah, and then there is a reading too, guys. This is not theology time. I shouldn't do this, but I will. Um, but there is a reading in which, you know, much of the, 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 the Old Testament isn't like excluded or contradicted by the New Testament, but there you go. Um, we're not here to exclude guys, we're here to include. Let's get back to this article from the development. The development of our sense of dignity is a crucial component of the utopianism and the egalitarian ideal. I know very well that utopianism is usually an object of derision in both socialist and liberal discourses. Yeah, and utopianism again, guys. Oh, we're going to build a utopia. It's going to be perfect and great. And a lot of people will be like, hey, grow up. Don't be a kid. That's not practical. It's not going to help us. Move on. Most philosophers and political theorists would rather burnish their realistic bona fides than be accused of vainly wishing for the impossible. And this is a huge thing in a lot of philosophy. A lot of the philosophy that you all like or would like is this tension as well of do we strive for the impossible. And Scarlett, I'm very happy that I was able to fuel your praise kink. I will try to keep that up in the future. Um, yeah. And Jesse call, I get what you're saying there. I get what you're saying. Um, let's see. Cool. Um, yeah, Scarlett and MVP first time or MVP. I love making up awards. Okay. So going from here, yet it strikes me that easy dismissals of utopia that reduce it to literary dreams of perfection radically misunderstand the motivational role of utopia in social life. Utopianism is not primarily about perfection, but perfectibility. It expands our horizons of expectations for our social relationships. The radicality of the egalitarian ideal is that it reshapes and develops the ethical sense of our human relationships by giving us a glimpse of what we should be. And hey, if you're still hanging out, liking the stream, chatting, appreciate it. It's kind of fun. We're reading, no matter what you do this week, you can be like, someone's like, what'd you do on Wednesday? I, I was at a reading group. I read a recent philosophy paper with 551 of my friends on the digital pred house that I'm a part of. Um, but, and you know, I think this is interesting too, right? Because when we, how I phrase this, um, I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but sometimes recently it's hard to feel like there is space for a truly radical hope about the world being different. Right. It's hard to look at. And this relates to the first hour of the stream. If I'm a young person, you know, I, I grew up, went to high school in Florida. But if I'm a young person now in a place like Florida and I'm hearing all this stuff, it's like, how can I really imagine a more radical and inclusive world? You know, Joshua in the chat before, I hope it's okay if I say this, Joshua. I don't know if they're still here. Um, that sort of um what was I about to say, sorry. Um, that it's Thursday. Guys, I'm sorry. It's been a, but it's, you know what it is? I'm going to, I'm going to defend myself because we had Monday off. It feels like Wednesday. You know what I mean? It's like the third day of my work week. You know what I'm saying? But it's a Thursday though. Um, but to get back to what Josh was saying before, you know, imagine you're Joshua's 
kid who's a, a trans person growing up in Florida, it might be hard to have a political imagination that's like, oh, stuff might get better. Imagine if you're a person of color growing up in a world where you see people that look like you um, getting shot by people that work for the government without any reinforcement, you know, with any, any, any justice. It's like, how can I imagine a fucking better world? Or if you're someone who is simply tramped down by student debt or, or can't pay rent or whatever, it's hard. And I think this article is, you know, getting at this idea that there's almost a danger in giving that up. And I know it's something I feel sometimes. So, you know, um, MDMA got me. I saved it right there. Uh, yeah, I think Pred House needs to be in, in the Wisecrack Live lore Bible. So let's let's go from. Yeah. OK, so in the so and here he gets into the principle of hope. Guys, Ernst Bloch rips. I think you would like his philosophy a lot. Kind of hard to read, a bit of a pain in the ass. So maybe read some summaries, but I think you would dig him. Um, so let's see. In The Principle of Hope, Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch located this anticipatory potential, what he called, get ready for Michael to mispronounce a German word in three, two, Vorschein, an art. By producing a vision of a society with substantially modified social relationships, Art estranges me from my current relations insofar as they no longer appear justifiable to me. The sweet dream of equality that I find in the dream work of art is only sweet because I come to recognize the bitter fruit I taste in daily life. Equality, I think, is as much a political state of affairs as an art to be cultivated. Guys, this is really interesting, right? And I think to me, this is very, um, you know, uh, getting at maybe the heart of, of wisecracky vibes, right? Thinking about the relationship between art and culture and, and politics and society. And what Block is getting at here is that art that gives us a vision of a better world. And, you know, we were talking before about even like, you know, cinema in a post-World War II context. Art that gives us that vision of a better world, a more just world, is both a sweet dream and bitter as we recognize the contradiction between that dream and our life. And I think we see this in a micro sense, like maybe you listen to a love song or you watch a movie or a sitcom with a really heartwarming story and you're like, oh, that's so great, but oh fuck, like I don't, I don't have that. And you're, you're aware of that, but you're aware of the possibility of that thing. Um, and, and I think Block is really good at getting at that role of, of art and things like that. Um, um, so, um, Sakib says, does the where is Jared questions ever get annoying? They do, but it, but the annoyance has nothing to do with how I feel towards Jared, a person I like. It's just with people doing that at this point, it's just like an annoying uh, troll move. So, yeah. Um, let's see. And yeah, and I listen. Oh heck yeah, guys! We're gonna we're gonna sneak Scarlett Voss into Pred House to dom those dudes. They need it. They really need it. Um, let's see. Um, just catching up with the chat. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're allowed to be a troll. You're allowed to be a troll as long as you're not abusive. <laughs> that's I think that's maybe our rule. Um, but yeah, let's get. I mean, yeah, and I wonder how the Pred House people would think of this article. Because, but here's the thing too. Think about this. Think about Pred House and the Pred House logic. <laughs> Andrew Tate has said before that he doesn't like read books or really watch cinema. People who I think sometimes live this kind of alt right dude bro lifestyle devalue art, devalue creativity. We'll talk about how those things take away from their ability to make money or be alpha. And we see how much then that not engaging with art and culture can affect one's ability to conceive of different worlds or different possibilities, man. And that's why I think that, you know, no matter how political or apolitical you are, art is important. Um, grumpy old man is is definitely a kind of troll. But yeah, and you can be a troll if you stay under your bridge. Um, okay, so thus my expectations of the norms of equality can be modified and reshaped. For instance, a society oriented around freedom of opportunity and individual responsibility. America can become desensitized to the declining life expectancy of its impoverished youth so long as it proceeds from their free choices of lifestyle. I'm going to read this one again, guys. And yes, Reclaim Dasein is right. You do got to pay the troll toll to get into that boy's soul. Um, I'm going to read this line again. 
For instance, a society oriented around freedom of opportunity and individual responsibility can become desensitized to the declining life expectancy of its impoverished youth so long as it proceeds from their free choices of lifestyle. I think in the same way, there's some people who might say, you know, for a society oriented around freedom of opportunity and individual responsibility, they can be desensitized to 14-year-olds working night shifts in factories as long as it proceeds from their free participation in the job market, right? Um, Prairie Fire says, to the privileged, equality feels like oppression. No, no, and that's that's pretty true because there was a line I heard. I don't know if you guys um, like the films of Adam Curtis. I, I do very, very much. Some of them are on YouTube. Sometimes it might be fun just to fucking have a day where we watch an Adam Curtis movie together. But Adam Curtis went on a podcast at one point, I think after hypernormalization came out. And his critique of the American left was something like, he was basically saying that he doesn't think a lot of left-leaning people in America understand that for things to get better, they might get worse. And that for things to change, people have to sacrifice. Um, and I think that's, so, so back to Prairie Fire's comment, the privilege to quality feels like oppression. Like, yeah, to certain people, the idea that I would have to sacrifice for the sake of another isn't freedom. That is oppression, where from another perspective, that's precisely what freedom is. Um, so going on, but if this state of affairs strikes us not only as unequal in fact, but also as a violation of the expectations we have of how society ought to be, then we may be moved to change it. It is also conceivable that we can see evidence of inequality and think that the inequality is acceptable for either principled or pragmatic reasons. Such defenses reflect, and I like this because it gets into how we defend inequality. Such defenses reflect two different types of social expectations we might have. On the one hand, we might think that inequality is normatively justified, in which case it will be unjust to try to make society more equal. And I think here, when we say it's normatively justified, I'm sure we've all heard this, seen this, maybe said it ourselves. There's this idea um that, that some people are like uh sorry that some people are 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 like well inequality is natural you know animal kingdom right animals eat other animals there's there's alpha people i see people in the chat talking about this you know there's there's alpha animals so inequality is natural some people have to suffer for others to have a lot someone has to win the race someone has to lose the race there's it's often a lot of like athletic or capitalist metaphors that get used to justify like natural inequality um Go ahead, Henry. The researcher who coined the alpha beta dichotomy in wolves has done a lot over the years to talk about how it's been misconstrued and misused as well, because he was specifically like it was with wolves in captivity who were under like specific conditions to uh, where they were like very resource scarce. Uh, and the alpha beta dichotomy is more of a reaction to like groups uh, fighting over limited resources and being made to be arranged in kind of that way. Hell yeah. I didn't even realize that people, this is how dumb I am, guys. I didn't know that all of that silly language was based on that. Someone just said, wait, this is live? Oh shit, this is live. We just saw that. I just saw you say this is live. Um, okay. Uh, wow, it auto played into this. That's fun. So the other option for this, you know, inequalities, on the other hand, we might think that inequality is unjust, but believe that attempts to alleviate inequality are either infeasible or will make life worse. This is kind of like the Adam Curtis point that like, well, guys, like I intellectually, I, I want there to be, you know, less inequality, but I also kind of like the situation that I have going and I, and I don't want to lose it, you know? So I think people can have that. So the essay goes on to say, but both of these attitudes, how I expect the world should be and how I expect the world to work, our expectations, they're going to be shifted by, by the art of equality. Oh guys, we're almost done. We're going we're gonna to read a whole essay together. If you're about to leave, Stick it out, guys. Stick it out. We're reading a whole philosophy essay together, guys. We're doing it together. Defenders of social hierarchy broadly construed warn that certain appeals to equality contravene the natural order of things. Oh, this is kind of like, this is a very Jordan Peterson-y thing as well, like this idea of, of hierarchy and, the, and naturalizing hierarchy. Um, hey, thank you for saying that. Yo, 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 the boy. Um, Omega, well, we got Omega females in the chat. We're really doing it, guys. We're really doing it. They worry that egalitarian visions will inflate the expectation of the members of society and induce them to action. They are right to think that the expectations of equality are artificial rather than natural, but they are wrong to suppose that from this fact alone, we ought to think that appeals to equality are less justifiable. 
My expectations of how others ought to comport themselves towards me are revisable. And necessarily so, since quality is not a fact, but a social value. One more paragraph. We're going to get through this. If you can't read, I'm reading it to you. Then I want to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Okay, guys? Um, equality may be a utopian dream, but it is a real dream insofar as it alters the motivations of our actions. Again, it's like art isn't real, but it is real in so much as it gives us a new perspective on the world and ourselves. Learning how to take oneself as equal to others and what social commitments follow from taking oneself as equal are not given by nature. Socialist thinkers have not only been arguing for a more equal and flourishing state of affairs, they've been developing the very art of thinking equality. The strength of this art wanes when we lower our expectations. The strength of the promise of the egalitarian ideal is to raise our expectations and renew our reasons for acting. Talking about raising expectations is like the idea that like, y'all deserve it. You guys deserve the world. You deserve a good life. So there you go. Um, Julia, you're allowed to be sassy if you're quitting smoking because it's good for you to quit smoking. And I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm not going to judge people who do smoke. You got to do what you got to do. But I'm proud of you for quitting because we want you to live for a very long time. And again, so this was written and Henry's put in the link in the chat to this article. Um, and this is from William M. Paris, assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto um, and a host of the What's Left of Philosophy podcast. So um, there you go. I think that was really interesting. And I think especially when we all think about the world, the conditions of the world, what we like, what we don't like in the relationship between art and our imaginations, that's cool. If anyone has thoughts on that, let me know. Extraneous says, why are you always live when I'm working? Well, we do this during the work day, you know? Um, there you go. B Van Glorious says you're poor because you offer nothing. B Van Glorious, how much do you make? Tell me. Because if you offer a lot, B Van Glorious, and don't lie, don't lie. Tell us how much money you make and what you do. B Van Glorious says it's fucking lazy thinking that excuses people's inability to adapt, change, or accept life has nuance. I don't know what people you're talking about, but tell us how, how much you make. Because if you're if you're very valuable, I want to know. But again. It's to say that someone's poor because they offer nothing is saying that the only value is value under a neoliberal economic system. And if that's what you think, I think that's totally fine. Just be consistent, you know? Um, but Kuyo Bo says, call me radical, but I, I believe people deserve to have dignity. But seriously, if you're, not, if you're not a troll, if you're not a troll, tell us how much money you make. How valuable are you? I want to know. I want to know how valuable you are by how much money you make. Someone said, how much Borat voice? You missed the first comment. Guys, I'm going to, what comment did I miss? So B. Van Glorious said, it's fucking lazy. Then they said, you're poor because you offer nothing. The black and white winners, losers dichotomy marries perfectly. Oh my God. B. Van, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. Guys, B. Van Glorious was giving an example of what other people think. And I thought that's what they think. Oh man, Vivian, thank you for having patience for me. Guys, this is this is a day of patience. I B Van Glorious was patient with me as I realized I missed his first comment, which gave context to what he was saying. So I really appreciate that. Others were patient today as we learned about, you know, the difference between Abrahamic and Judeo-Christianity. I really appreciate it. Uh, but Vivian Glorious, you're if um, you know, we already have our MVP. Um, or Scarlet Voss is our sort of rookie of the year in the chat today. Be Van Glorious. You get award for you get an award for your patience of dealing with me as I recklessly misinterpret your contribution. Um, and so don't tell us how much money you make and how people know if they ever say anything like that to me, I'm just going to be like, how much money do you make? But it's hard. You know, it's like they should make how much you can say in a chat longer, but then also some of you might not take it. You might you might abuse that that privilege. Um, Gordon's right. I'm going to learn patience. So again, guys, today's Lexa and Henry's birthday stream. So let's give some happy birthdays to Lexa and Henry. Um, let's see. Leading the stream. Okay. Um, so really, so happy birthday to them. Thank you so much for hanging out today, guys. Just a few, a few notes. Um, if you're not watching the videos on Mondays and Fridays, Please watch them. It means a lot. We also have a Helen video coming out soon. And if you if you tuned into the little stream we did last week, you saw that you got behind the streams. I appreciate you too, B Van Glorious. I really, 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 truly do. Um, as always, 
I love you all just for being here, for being the best chat on YouTube. Really, truly mean that. You guys are great. Especially be Van Glorious is great for patients. Um, you know, consider being a member, consider signing up on Patreon. It does help us. Remember, we have an email address, wisecracklive666 at gmail.com. I'm going to catch up on that. Um, if there's stuff you want us to watch, if there's articles you want us to read, if you have ideas for the stream, if there's something you wanted to say in chat, but you didn't get time to spout it off, but want to make sure you get that out, please send that to us. The next video, I think the next video is about lazy. No, the next video coming out, I think is going to be on the WGA strike. Um, and strikes in general. So we have a video coming out on Friday that's sort of about both the WGA strike and how that um, goes into the history of strikes and unions in general. Then we have a video on laziness coming out. Um, and yesterday, what did we film on yesterday? Yesterday was kind of a blur, guys. But we have a lot of good conspiracy theories. Yes, we have a video coming out on conspiracy theories. Yeah. Oh, then it's going to be good, guys. Birthday Henry's on it. Um, okay, guys, so this has been Wisecrack Live for June 1st. Give some more happy birthdays on the way out. And as Cranig man put in the chat new season of I think you should leave dropped. So yes. Watch that. E email us, watch the streams later, leave comments, all the sort of stuff. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next week with a special guest right here on Wisecrack Live. Thanks for joining y'all. See you next week.